Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to our spring semester. Um, good to see Jeram, Lucy, Deepu, Esther, Daniel, Sam, Daniel, 20 of you, <laughs> Andrew, Anjali, Ranu, Diksha, Divya, Esther, <coughs> Jennifer. Kofi, John, Miriam, Pankaj, Sanjay, thank you all for joining class. I hope you all had a good um, holiday season, good time with family and friends. Um, how many of you are excited to get back to classes? Oh, nice to see the in-person raising students raising their hands. I thought they will miss home to our online students. Yes, Kofi, you want to say something? You raised your hand. OK. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, have a blessed new year as well. Good morning to all of you. Um, so we're going to be studying um, Christology. Uh, are you excited to study Christology? Okay, when you thought about Christology, what comes to your mind? Christ, okay? <laughs> that is a very good uh, answer. You think about this course, Christology, what comes to your mind? Don't look at your course notes. Just tell me what comes to your mind. Did you ever think, hey, what are we going to study in Christology? We didn't give it a thought. Maybe thought, okay, when she teaches, let's learn. <laughs> yeah? Okay? What comes to your mind when you think about Christology? Okay, so Angeline says about the character of Christ, nature. Okay? Lucy says knowing more about Christ. Okay? Anything else? It comes to your mind? Yes, Sanjay says, if biology is the study of life, Christology is the study of Christ. OK, very interesting. Good. <laughs> okay. Yes, we had one in-person student say that as well. OK, I'll let you know what we're going to study in Christology. OK, Jennifer says, knowing the Christ. Yes, knowing the Christ. Do we really know the Christ? We know about him, but having a personal knowing is still yet to happen in many areas, OK? OK, uh, before we look at what Christology is all about, uh, into the court, um, let's just uh, pause for a word of prayer. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for um, another season where we can come together to learn, God, from your word. Because your word is life, your word is power, your word is authority. Your word teaches us all things, trains us in righteousness and holiness, God. It corrects us, it rebukes us. We thank you for your word that reveals more of who you are and what you did here on this earth, Father. We thank you, God. We pray that um, we thank you for being with us through the last year, God. We thank you for being with us, for guiding us, for leading us, for teaching us, for enabling us, for strengthening us. God, for the way that you are transforming us more into the image and the likeness of um, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you, God, for um, guiding us and leading us whole of last year. And we know, God, even as we go through this new year, that you, are God, are good and faithful. You're perfect in your faithfulness and God in your <coughs> perfect faithfulness you will do wonderful things for us even in this new year God and we pray that um, even as we continue to submit and Amen. surrender our lives and yield our lives to you Father that we will be transformed more into your image and likeness and that we would manifest your glory here on earth God that we would be people who glorify you in everything that we do and that we will manifest your glory in a greater measure, in a greater way, Father. We thank you for uh, this course, for where we're going to study more about the nature of uh, Jesus Christ. And even as we do, we pray 
that will be such a life transforming experience for each one of us not just knowing the deeper truths the revelation of who jesus really is but will have such a profound impact in our lives god and will transform us and will help us to see things see life and see ministry and and look at everything in such a different perspective god that we would um, uh, it will just enable us to walk in greater measure of uh, holiness and reverence towards you and your word and uh, towards what you was you have called us in your ministry god and that we would be people uh, who continue to build your kingdom with power and authority with this great revelations and this truth that we are going to learn father we thank you we bless you in jesus name we pray amen <clears throat> okay so um christology is um, basically a field of study within uh, christian theology so what does the word theology mean to study about god yes um a uh, theology comes from uh, when you look at it in the greek there are two uh, words now uh, uh, before we go further I'd like to say that i will be i'll give me i will be uh, you know sharing a lot of content that is not there in your notes so I'd like you to follow your notes and if it's not there i would like you to make uh, take down notes so that when you you know face assess assessments you would not think that i'm giving you something out of the blue but it's something out of the known that i've been teaching you so please listen and also take down notes okay so um the word theology comes from two greek words theos and logia okay what does theos mean god theos means god yes thank you sister getrude theos means god t h e o s is theos which means god the greek word and logia means yes it's a study of the word of god so logia l o g i a which means uh, you know word logia is word okay uh, where we get the word logos okay so logia which means word and theos means god so combining these two words theos and logia theology means the study of the word of god okay now christian theology is basically an effort by us human beings you know to describe in human words god and his actions okay so theology there is there are various theologies okay systematic theology which you're going to study you know christology various other theologies feminist theology and all of those theologies basically theology is or christian theology is an effort made by us human beings uh, to describe in human words uh, god and his actions so we are trying to understand who god is and we are trying to in our own human words trying to describe him uh, who god is and his actions so especially his actions in relation to the world and to man so christian theology is basically that aspect how god relates to the world and relates to us as human beings or as men and women and as children and because it is christian theology uh, it is written from a point of view uh, of those who accept jesus christ as the one whom god has made himself fully known to men okay so theology is an effort of us human beings trying to describe god his efforts his his actions um in human words okay especially his actions in relation to the world and to man and because it is christian theology we are looking at it from a point of view of those who accept jesus as the one in whom god has made himself fully known to mankind okay now christology is a study or a field of study within christian theology <coughs> excuse me uh, which is concerned with the nature of jesus christ okay so in christology which is a field of study in christian theology which is basically concerning the nature of 
Jesus Christ. Okay, so particularly we are going to look at how humanity and divinity coexisted in the person of Jesus Christ. Okay, we're basically looking at how Jesus was fully God, fully man. We're going to look at how Jesus was 100% God and how Jesus was 100% man. So how divinity and how humanity coexisted in the person of Jesus Christ. Okay. Now, when you look at this word Christology, the Greek, the, the Greek word for Christology, it comes from two Greek words, Christos, okay, C-H-R-I-S-T-O-S, -S, Christos. So what's the meaning of Christos? Christos? Christ. Okay, Christ. What is the meaning of Christ? The anointed one. Yes, the anointed one. Thank you. Or the Messiah. Okay. So Christos means the anointed one or the Messiah. And Logos, again, is word. Okay. So it's a study of things related to this particular subject. Okay. The anointed one or the Messiah and the word. Okay, so Christology is basically concerning how humanity and divinity coexisted in the person of Jesus Christ. How can a person have both humanity and divinity? How can a person be 100% God and 100% man? How can a person be fully God and fully man? Okay, so that is what we are going to study in Christology. We're not going to be generally uh, studying or we are going to be less concerned with the details of Jesus's life um, but we are going to be concerned more about how humanity and divinity coexisted in the person of Jesus Christ okay and it's basically considering this question that the Lord Jesus uh, you know asked his disciples in Matthew chapter 16 verse 13 what is the question Jesus asked his disciples in Matthew chapter 16 verse 13 Anyone knows? <laughs> Matthew chapter 16, verse 13. You can look it up. What's the question Jesus asked them? Yes. Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Okay. So it's basically considering this question that Jesus put to his disciples uh, when he was at the coast of Caesarea Philippi, when he asked his disciples, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? Okay. So what was people's understanding of who Jesus was? What did they answer? Some say you are Elijah. What else did they say? Some say you are John the Baptist. Some say you are Jeremiah. Others say that you are one of the prophets. And when they were giving all these answers, they were answering according to their own, yeah, their own imagination, their own knowledge, their own understanding, according to the understanding of flesh and blood. But what does um, Peter say? You are the Christ, the son of the living God. Thank you, Sanjay. And many of our in-person students also said that. They said, you are the son, uh, you're the son of God. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. Okay. And what does Jesus tell him when he answers this question? Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. <laughs> yes. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father in heaven. Father in heaven. Yes. Okay. So, uh, we are basically going to be answering this question, okay? Who, Jesus is asking you, who do men say I, the son of man, am, okay? So, um, the problem with Christology is, you know, the mystery of incarnation, right? How can God become man? So, that's a big problem with Christology. Um, and students of Christology kind of, grapple with this whole question, even as they try to understand it. Uh, you know, has God indeed become man? Did God really become man? 
you know, how can Logos truly become flesh? How can the word become flesh? And, uh, you know, how can deity and humanity coexist in perfect unity uh, in one person, Jesus Christ? So these are some of the questions that a student who is studying Christology will encounter, okay? Uh, while we, you know, um, try to answer all of these questions, you know, uh, we shall not attempt, or I should, I, I can, I'll say we shall not dare to attempt and answer the how of incarnation, because we really can't, you know, answer the how of incarnation. How did God become man? We can't answer that. Okay, but we shall only try to understand and affirm what scripture says or what Bible says concerning the person of Jesus Christ. Okay, so in Christology, we are going to be studying about um, the deity of Christ and the humanity of Christ. So when we study the deity of Christ, we will be looking at his pre existence. We have to prove that. If he is Jesus' is God, he had to be pre-existent, his eternal nature. Uh, we look at the Old Testament prophecies regarding Christ. And then we look at Christ's humanity. We look at his incarnation, how he was sinless. We look at his death, his resurrection, his ascension, his exaltation. And we will also be looking at his return. Okay. Um, so let's begin our study about looking and studying about the divinity of Jesus Christ, okay? Now, if you have to prove that Jesus is God, we have to prove that he is pre-existent, okay? Or his nature is one of being eternal, okay? Because only God is eternal. When we say eternal, what do we mean? Forever without end, okay? When we say eternal, what do we mean? Endless, everlasting, okay? No beginning, no end, always was, always is, always will be, okay? So we look and study uh, the pre-existence of Christ. Now, when we are trying to prove, uh, when we study Christology or any theology, it's all uh, it's theological, uh, any field in theology, it'll all be based out of the word of God. So we'll be looking at a lot of scripture passages, which we'll be studying in um, detail. Okay. So the pre-existence of Christ, chapter one, did Christ exist before he come, he came into this world? Yes, no, yes, yes. I'm sure about it. Yes, okay, yes. thank you. So, how can we prove to people that Christ existed before he came into this world? John 1 1, okay, yes. what else? Genesis chapter 1 was. Okay, Genesis yeah. chapter 1, verse 26. Okay. Yes, anyone else? Creation, Lucy says, okay. A good chapter to look at or to take people to is John chapter 1. Okay, uh, let's read John chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. Can somebody read that, please? John chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. Amen. Thank you, Sister Gertrude. Can somebody else read John chapter 1, verse 14, please? John chapter 1, verse 14. And the word become flesh and dwelt among us. And we be Held. We beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Amen. So here, 
who is john introducing who is john introducing in john chapter 1 jesus jesus and jesus. who is and um, yes thank you is introducing jesus and what how is he introducing jesus as as the word that he was in the beginning okay he was in the beginning but what is the uh, the word he's using to talk about jesus is the word of god word yes he's saying in the beginning was the word way right. if you look at the word in the beginning was the word and the word was with god and the word was god if you look at the w can you see something different there It's a capital It's a W, right? We don't usually write capital W in the middle of a sentence for a word, right? Yes. It has to be a small W. But here, when you're talking about yes, it's in caps. So when you're talking about W word, it's referring to a person, referring to Jesus. So even in scripture, when we see when uh, talking about the Holy Spirit, and you just mentioning Spirit, it'll be a capital S, referring to the person. the holy spirit when you're talking about god in, in comparing to other gods we talk about we put a capital g okay when we're talking about god he when you're referring to he, him as he him it's all in capital h okay so here we see that he's talking about jesus christ and referring to jesus christ as or the messiah as the word Okay, and he's saying the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and then he's saying the word was God, and he was with God in the beginning. All things were made through him, and without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life. That means he's saying in this word, who is God, in him, and he was pre-existent. He was with God. He created everything. In him was life, and the life. was the light of men and in verse 14 he says the word became flesh talking about incarnation how god became man and dwelt among us dwelt means lived among us and we beheld his glory the glory of the one and only begotten of the father full of grace and truth okay did you ever wonder why john introduces jesus as the word why can't he say in the beginning was jesus and the, and jesus was with god and jesus was god why do you think he has to introduce jesus as the word and what is the greek word for word logos 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 so if you read it say in the beginning was the logos the logos was with god and the logos was god have you ever wondered why john introduces jesus as the logos or the word Can you please? Uh, the Old Testament. Okay, uh, it was they more or less kept hearing God's voice, His word. Okay. Yes, God's word was very significant for them. They 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 didn't see God. They heard more of His voice and what He said and what He spoke. Yes. Anyone else? Why does he John create, uh, sister? He created the universe with his spoken word. He created the stars, the moon, and the sun, and uh, everything was created by his spoken word. Yes, thank you, Gertrude. That's uh, that's so important because the Jews. Uh, John is writing to a Jewish audience, and he knew that the Jews knew the importance of God's word because God spoke, and everything came into existence. everything came into being everything you know everything is held by god's word yes and the laws which they gave so much of importance to the commandments all was spoken by uh, god the word yes was had such an important place in the life of the uh, jews okay anyone else has any other thoughts okay um let's look at um uh some of the reasons why we think that john you know introduced jesus as the logos or the word okay now the greek word logos when it's translated in the new testament can mean report judgment speech reason or word okay 
But when we look at this word logos in the historical Jewish setting, okay, it had a much more profound and a richer and a deeper meaning. And that is why, you know, uh, uh, John is, uh, Apostle John is using logos to introduce uh, Jesus as the one who is God and who, who became incarnate, okay? So um, why does he use it? Because of the, uh, the philosophy that was already there uh, around this word logos and the rich meaning uh, that it had in the historical Jewish setting. So there was a Greek philosopher. Uh, we know that, you know, um, basically, in Jesus' time, they lived in Rome, and there was a mix of uh, um, uh, uh, Roman and uh, Greek uh, learning and teaching. So this uh, Heraclitus, a Greek philosopher who lived in the 6th century, you know, he defined this word logos as an internal principle, an eternal principle which gives order to the universe. So basically... He, he was looking at the universe and uh, this philosopher and he was looking at it and he was seeing that there's so much of order and there's so much of coherence, which means there's reason and order. And uh, when you look at nature, he he looked at it at, 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 at like nature having a reason, which means it was not just created arbitrarily or, or just did not come out with a big bang or just did not happen, you know, accidentally. Uh, just did not come to being by itself, but he saw it as there's somebody behind it giving it perfect order and coherence. Um, so there was reason and order in the universe. And he, he looked at this Logos as this invisible hand, which we can't see, you know, uh, ensuring that there is a sense of structure unity and harmony in nature even though there were changes that were happening in nature so looking at nature this philosopher is trying to reason who is behind this whole nature so he you know doesn't he coins his word as logos and says this logos is this invisible hand which is making sure that everything in this universe has sense structure harmony even in the midst of constant change that is happening in the world okay another greek philosopher chrysippus who lived in the third century he defined logos as a purposeful and a guided guiding reason as a purposeful and guiding um, reason so for chrysippus this philosopher logos basically uh, represented um, somebody who was a rational, which means a rational means we're not saying, you know, somebody who has a mind that is, uh, has wisdom, purpose, knowledge, creativity, not somebody who's doing something arbitrary, just out of hand, just, you know, by whims and fancies, no, somebody, a rational mind, you know, so for him, Logos represented a rational and a purposeful force that govern the universe, uh, bringing about or providing order and meaning of existence. So when he looked at creation, there's so much of order and meaning and purpose uh, to everything. And so he says, it is this logos that is bringing about this rational and this purposeful force that is governing this whole universe. And other philo philosophers during this time, basically, um, you know, uh, understood Logos as a rational principle in the mind which is expressed in speech, okay? So they're trying to uh, understand, you know, how is there such perfection and order in creation? So they ba basically, uh, Logos is representing, you know, the ability of human reason and human intellect uh, uh, to explain how everything in this in, uh, in this universe in this nature is so perfect and they're expressing it their thoughts through human communication through human words so for other philosophers logos essentially points to you know the role of reason and speech as uh, essential components of understanding and expressing the world okay now if you didn't understand anything about these philosophers doesn't really matter Okay, it just, they're trying to understand how is their perfect order and, uh, you know, and unity and structure in creation. They're saying it's because of this Logos. This Logos is this guiding principle. This Logos is this um, 
you know, um, purposeful reason uh, who's providing uh, existence and also this eternal pr principle who's giving order to the universe. Okay. Now, because, and also in the mind of these Jewish readers that John is writing to, um, you know, they had this whole understanding of, um, you know, this logos as uh, they had a, a, a dual understanding, a double understanding of this word logos uh, for the Jewish in, uh, the Jewish people. They understood it as a powerful and creative word of God in the Old Testament by which he created the heavens and the earth, like some of you already uh, mentioned, okay? Like we read in Psalm 33, verse 6. So already this logos was there in the mind of the readers, and this... Um, you know, um, and at this time when John was writing, there was this huge, enormous significance of this word logos and the meaning that was attached to this word logos. And also because another uh, uh, philosopher um, or an, sorry, an Old Testament Jewish interpreter who the Jews held with high, uh, you know, regard was Philio. Now, Philio was an Old Testament Jewish interpreter who lived during the first century AD. And he tried to understand who this Logos was. And he said this Logos is an intermediary between God and the universe. So he said that this Logos is basically, he saw a, a Logos as somebody who is divine. Uh, and this connecting force that bridged the gap between the transcendent God and the material world. Or he saw this uh, Logos as somebody who, you know, facilitated communication and interaction between the divine realm or the spiritual realm and the physical realm or the heavenly realm and the earthly realm. So he saw this Logos as an intermediary between God and man. And so since there was such a rich culture and a, a significance and an understanding for this word logos and this enormous significance attached to this word you know john picks it up okay and takes his word logos and then john says hey this logos actually is not just a guiding reason he's not just a principle in the mind okay that is giving order to this universe it's not even an intermediary between god and man or between the physical realm and the spiritual realm or the heavenly realm and the earthly realm but he introduces this logos and he says this logos is god okay so in john chapter one um you know he's he's basically declaring four important attributes of this logos okay so he's saying that this logos you know was in the beginning okay so he's indicating that Jesus Christ, who is the Messiah, he existed not only before he came into this world as a baby, was born as a baby, but also before all time, before even time began, even before the foundation of the world, you know, he was there. He was not just from the beginning, but he was in the beginning, okay, very important. John does not say in the beginning was the word. I mean, he says in the beginning was the word, which means he doesn't say from the beginning. He doesn't say that. No, he says in the beginning. Okay, when you say from the beginning means, okay, Jesus had a beginning. Okay, there was a time when he was from. But he says in the beginning was the word, which means that even in the beginning, Jesus was there. Okay, so he was there before all time. He was not just from the beginning, but he was also in the beginning. And he had his being before the beginning, even before time began, even before the foundation of the world. He had his being, he was existent even before the beginning. So we can say he never began and therefore was ever. So there was never a time when he was not. There will never be a time when we cease to exist. He always existed. He is existing and he will always exist. Okay. So we can say he never began. There was never a time when he began and therefore was ever. 
Okay, so the first thing important attribute he introduces about this logos was he says the word was in the beginning. That means he was there from the not from the beginning, but he was already there in the beginning. He was already existent. The second thing, second attribute he says is the word was with God. Okay, so by saying this, what is John trying to prove? By saying that the word was with God, what is John trying to prove? Okay, along with the Father, the Son was there. So what is he trying to prove? That both are one. Yes, both are one, that he is God, right? Yes. That Jesus was ever with God the Father and he was ever with God the Holy Spirit, okay? Like we read in John chapter 1 verse 18. What Can somebody read that please? John chapter 1 verse 18. Can somebody read John chapter 1 verse 18? No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father he has declared him. Yes, here John says, one who was in the bosom of the father. What does it mean by saying he was in the bosom of the father? What does it mean, the bosom of the father? What does it mean? Yes, very close to the father. You know, a child is very close to the mother. The mother holds it in his bosom, where her bosom, very close. Okay, which means very intimately one with the father. Okay, so he was very intimately one with the Father, means very close with the uh, Father. So the Word was with God. It's the second attribute that he is introducing about uh, this Logos, who is Jesus Christ. What is the third attribute? Third attribute, he says, is the Word. The beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word, the word was with God. God. Yes, thank you, Warren. The word was God. So he's saying that this Logos is not an intermediary or is not a guiding principle, you know, um, or an eternal principle. He is God. So he's saying Jesus was God. Jesus is God. Which means he's saying that he possessed the essence of what makes God. God. When you talk about he possessed the essence, the word essence basically means he possessed the nature or the characteristics of God. Okay. Essence, E S S E N C E, not vanilla essence or strawberry essence that we put in food or chocolate essence. This is essence talking about the nature or the characteristic of uh, God. Okay. Uh, so he says he possessed the essence or the in some of uh, the theologian says he possessed the substance and the word is uh, they use for substance is homo usios h o m o u s o i s means same in being or same in essence so when you're saying same in substance same in essence essence it means all that made god god Okay, all the nature that makes God God was in Jesus Christ. He had the same essence, the same substance. Some places you will read by some theologian, same essence, same substance. You might be wondering, hey, what is the substance of God? It just means the same nature, the characteristics, the being that makes God God. So this he's saying this logos was not an intermediary creature. He's not some intermediary creature between God and man, the Logos was God himself because he has the same essence, the being that makes God, God, okay? And Psalm 90 was to uh, highlights a very important attribute of God. Can somebody read that, please? Yeah. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Amen. Thank you, Warren says that from everlasting to everlasting you are God okay so there's never a time when he began there will never time when he ceased to exist from everlasting to everlasting he is God he's God from everlasting to everlasting God transcends time 
uh, therefore in saying that the word was god we understand that this logos who is jesus christ was from eternity which means uh, or was from everlasting which means from eternity past and will be everlasting which means eternity future so when we say eternity everlasting to everlasting we mean from eternity past to eternity future okay so we looked at the three attributes the first thing was in the beginning was the word second attribute the word was with god the third thing the word was god and the fourth thing in him was in him is life yes in him is life in him was life in him is life now do you know what's the greek word for life yes zoe zoe thank you uh, is zoe now this word uh, when it's used in the new testament uh, uh, refers to uh, spiritual life especially to eternal life eternal life that comes from god Uh, when uh, when we have faith in Jesus Christ um so it's basically meaning spiritual life or eternal life that we receive from god uh, when we put our faith in Jesus Christ but very interesting to look at what more about this word zoe so let's look at john chapter 5 verse 26 which gives us a deeper insight into this word zoe or life can somebody read that please John chapter 5 verse 26 For as the Father has life Zoe in himself so he has granted the son to have life Zoe in himself Amen So when we look at this verse and we look at this word life is talking about Zoe it says for as the Father has life in himself so he has granted the son to have life in him self So when we when we look at this word zoe or what we understand from this word zoe is basically zoe is the life that god has in him self okay god is self existent he is uh, are we self existent are we self existent no no why because we are created beings okay we dependent we dependent on what we dependent on god we dependent on oxygen right we dependent on the temperature we dependent on so many environmental factors for us to breathe and be healthy and uh, be alive right so uh, we are not self existent uh, beings okay um we are created beings and uh, not like god he is self existent he is self sustained um uh, he does not depend on anything on anyone for his existence um okay and he's not dependent also on any outward source for his existence we also depend on food and water for our existence right so the zoe is basically the self existent self sustaining and the eternal life of god okay so jesus Uh, when he says that in him was life in this logos or this word was life he's saying that hey in jesus is the self existing existent self sustaining and the eternal life of god eternal life means it uh, life from eternity past to eternity future and because he has this zoe in him he is god he is not uh not just that he has zoe but he is zoe okay here like we read in john chapter 5 verse 26 it says so he granted the son to have zoe in himself so jesus does not just have uh, the zoe in himself in fact he is zoe which means in fact he is just he is life how do we know that jesus said i am the way the truth and the life life so he just does not have this zoe or he just does not have this life in himself but in fact he is 
life. Okay, so that is what Jesus says. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so by introducing these four important aspects of who this Logos is, John is basically defining and declaring who this Logos is. And he is presenting this Logos and referring to him as God himself. Okay, so isn't that beautiful the way he introduces and the way he makes known uh, who Jesus is? Okay, so when we study this, um, the scripture in John chapter 1, we basically see that Jesus is pre existent, he was there in the beginning, that means he existed even before the beginning, even before the foundation of the world, and he is self-existent, and he is from um, everlasting to everlasting, which means he's from eternity past to eternity future, and there'll be never a time when he was never there, never ceased to exist, and there will never be a time when he will stop existing, and hence he is God, okay? We will also look at as um, his... Uh, nature and attributes. So as a pre-existent Christ, you know, we will look at um, Christ's nature and his attributes, okay? So if he is God, then he has to have the nature and the attributes of that make God, God, right? And if he has that, then we can prove that Jesus is God. So we're going to look from scripture and prove that Jesus is is pre-existent he is the pre-existent christ and also will prove that he has the nature and the attributes of god okay an important um, scripture passage that talks about the nature and the attributes of god uh, is philippians chapter 2 verses 5 to 7 okay so if somebody asks you hey prove to me that jesus is god what, which passage would you use? John chapter 1, okay? If somebody asks you, hey, prove to me that uh, Jesus has the nature and the attributes of God, one of the verses you can use is Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 7. Can we read that, please? You, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bond servant and coming in the likeness of men. Okay. Um, so here we see that, you know, uh, Jesus Christ, who being in the form of God, okay, did not consider it to be equal or robbery with God, but made himself of no reputation, and he took upon himself a, uh, the form of a bond servant. Again, the word form here, coming in the likeness of men. Very important scripture passage. We'll study a bit about it here, and we'll study more about it in detail in the other uh, chapters. But we will be coming back to this uh, verse again and again and studying because it is it's it has such deep theological truths for us to understand and learn. But I'll stop here because we just have uh, one minute and I can't explain the whole thing. Uh, anyone has any questions? Ma'am, in the opening remarks, we were discussing that, you know, the entire discourse will be uh, dealing more with regard to the why of, you know, Christ and Christology. But uh, the way we've summarized in the first passage of John, hmm. it also addresses even the how also. Yeah, but we're not going to get into the depth of how, you know. I mean, how did he become man? Uh, how did he become man? We we don't know the entire process. I'm talking about the process, okay? I'm not talking about the entire process, how he became man. We can't explain that. But we are just going to look at the incarn why of incarnation. Why did God become man? Any questions? No? Uh, this is a very important course. Um, Christology, foundational to our uh, very uh, understanding of Christ 
and the truth. So I request you to please go back, look at uh, the, the passages we looked at and study it in detail so it can be ingrained in your mind. And, uh, you know, these truths can uh, really minister and you can also teach others the same. Okay. If there are no questions, we'll end class. Thank you all for joining class and um, I'll meet you on Friday. Right? Okay. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, sister. Thank you. Thank you, Warren. Thank you.